We have. We, after a long wait, we've been in our new building now for about nine months. Everything's set up and ready to go. Now, are you still able to produce all of the aircraft that you used to produce? Yeah, we still produce all 14 of the aircraft in both standard uh, uh, full component kits as well as quick build kits. Now, when you talk about all of those aircraft, 14, how many of them are ultralights and how many are, say, experimental aircraft? We've got five ultralight single seat part 103 legal ultralights. Uh, we have five biplanes and then the balance are two seat uh, monoplanes. Now, they're all basically the same style of construction, though, are they not? They are. They're the basic geodetic. They're all wood aircraft. Basic geodetic where you've got, you're using the interaction of the material uh, to give the strength. So you're using a lighter gauge material and using that interaction to produce a very strong, very light aircraft. Now, this one here is what, the Skeeter? Yes, it's the 505 Skeeter. Now, and, is this a customer's airplane? What are you getting no, this is actually, this we're uh, putting together to take to Oshkosh as a, uh, a basic skin uh, skeleton aircraft. We'll have it varnished up, ready to go. The engine will be hung on it. Uh, and then when we get back from Oshkosh, we'll finish it up and uh, yeah, have it ready for flying next year. You told me a story that someone indicated that they didn't think you could build a Part 103 legal ultralight? That's correct. We, we always have been said that the, the, our line of single-seat aircraft are, are difficult or impossible to build as a, as a legal Part 103 aircraft. Uh, so we're building this aircraft just to prove that wrong. And uh, when we take it shows, we'll put it on scale so people can see that it can be built at the 254-pound level without a problem. Now, you're offering these airplanes in a number of different ways. Uh, you're offering it, first of all, in a plans-built version? Yes, that's correct. And then you go and you have a series of quick-build kits, or how many? What, basically what you can do is there's the plans only, there's a set of three uh, partial kits that basically breaks it into a wing kit, a fuselage kit, and then a finishing kit. Uh, and those can be done as a quick build version or standard version. So, for example, with the wing, if you buy the standard version of the wing kit, it's got all the materials ripped and uh, shaped for you and everything, but no assembly has been done. If you buy the quick build wing kit, the spars are pre-assembled for you, the ribs are pre-assembled, and it's more of an assembly process. So it's available both ways. And then finally, you can buy a full quick build aircraft, which has all the ribs, the uh, spars, the fuselage sides, the tail group completely done for you. Uh, and you can also buy that as a standard full airframe kit. Now we look at this airframe that we have here. How far along are we on this? Like, is this would this be a kit that would come out looking like this if a customer would order? Like no, this is this is a quick build kit that's been assembled uh, past what you, the customer would receive. The customer would receive the fuselage sides all pre-assembled. The tail group would be done. Uh, but then the customer's responsibility would be to basically make the uh, the fuselage into a boat, uh, uh, put the uh, tail group on, and then do the uh, the turtle deck on the back and putting in the uh, rigging for the wings. Okay. Now we have a quick build kit in a wing, do we not over here? We do. Let's go have a look at it and we can just explain some of the, the things that we're going to do. Sure. Okay, so we were talking a little earlier about someone that's ordering a set of plans, for example, and a raw materials kit. We have a, a wing here, and that basically gives us an idea where we're going with this thing. Right. Uh, the one advantage with our aircraft is the plans are full size, full scale. So as you can see here, we're looking at, at a rib uh, on our uh, 505 that we were just looking at. And uh, it's really easy to build because you've got it full size right in front of you. So basically in the standard materials kit, you'd get the, the plans, you get the material, Here's the cap strips for the ribs that are machined to shape. They're grooved. We use a grooving method uh, in wood construction so that you don't have to gusset each corner so it makes the assembly much quicker. And uh, the glue gets its surface area through the, uh, through the groove that's in the material. Uh, on the plans and in the instruction manual, it tells you how to build all the jigs. The rib jig is actually the only jig you're going to require for building the, the aircraft. Everything else is self-jigging. So you build up a, uh, a jig like this, and the material just bends into the, to the jig, and uh, you'd lay it out for the rib. The geodetic is also in the ribs as well, and you can see that on the drawings here, uh, where we're using the geodetic structure to create uh, strength in the wings. And the neat thing, again, with wood aircraft is you don't require any special tools. So most of the cutting and everything that we do in the, uh, in the 
wing kit is either done with a little handsaw or actually with a pair of garden uh, prune shears that's a single anvil garden prune shear. So if we were fitting the geodetic into here, we would measure it out on the plan, see how far we need it to be, and literally just cut it with the garden shears rather than doing the hand and cut, and then you're fitting it into the jig as you go. So how long would it take me to build one rip? Well, what typically what you're going to do is you're going to lay one out uh, dry fit it, which means you're not going to glue it, uh, and then take it apart and make the, part, the parts for all of the ribs all at once. So it I speeds see. So the you'll, process. So you'll have all of the, the tops, all of the bottoms, all of the geodetics, and then... And then you're going to be assembling it. And typically what we tell customers to do is build two or three jigs, and uh, it takes maybe 20 minutes to put one together once the parts are, are uh, cut. And so you, you spend an hour putting uh, the three ribs together, you set them aside, you let them dry, you go work on another part of the aircraft, you come back the next day and you repeat that process over and over. Uh, on a standard monoplane aircraft, you're going to have 28 full ribs and 28 half ribs. So it takes a, a few days to get all the ribs done, but it's not a difficult process at all. And what does the rib look like when it's finished? Then? When, the, when the rib's all finished, it looks just like this. Uh, again, you notice that there are no, uh, no gussets in any of the corners. Uh, we're going into the groove, so you use the glue surface area there. The glue that we're using is, is T88 structural epoxy. Uh, a big advantage with the glue is, well, two big advantages is it's a simple 50-50 mix. So uh, you don't need any special pumps or scales for, for weighing it out. It's been around for a long time, has a great track record. But one of the other big advantages, and you use it when in wing assembly, is the bond is not affected by water. So you can actually glue, laminate the wing tips together with the, the material wet, and it dries, the glue dries, and the bond is exactly the same as it was as if it was uh, done on a dry piece of wood. Okay, so we've got the ribs done. And I guess the next is the spars then? Yeah, the spars and this, the spars we're showing here, this is actually how the spars would come if you ordered a quick build kit. With uh, the spar assembled, all of the fittings have been, uh, been fit uh, and drilled for you. The, the fittings come pre-machined and drilled and labeled for you. And uh, so you've got a front and rear spar. And the basic construction is, it's an I-beam construction. So you've got a Sitka spruce top and bottom uh, cap strip and then the, uh, the shear web in between is 8th inch uh, aircraft grade birch and uh, create, makes a very strong yet very light uh, spar. Now, are these spars inter interchangeable between the units or each airplane has its own different configuration? Uh, there's some commonality in the, uh, the FP series, the 202, uh, 505, 606 all use the exact same spar, it's the same wing design, uh, and we just changed the, the design of the, of the fuselage really to make the different models out of it. Say you take someone not really familiar, is it, wants to get their hands wet, wants to get up and flying, but really is a little iffy on this and whether they can do it or not, what would you suggest? Well, an ideal place to start is actually with one of our, our single-seat aircraft, and you're, you can start with, you know, the easiest aircraft to put together and probably the quickest to put together is our FP-303. Uh, and you're looking at, with a standard built kit, you're looking about 300 hours to put it together. Uh, you get a great low-wing, low uh, fun-flying aircraft, but it's very stable, very easy to fly, a great way to build time. And what would be something uh, up from that then as far as I would spend a little bit more time, get a little uh, bit different airplane? Right, and you can look, you know, go into other of our, our single seat aircraft like the 505 we were just looking at as a, as a parasol. We have uh, uh, a little bit more elaborate low wing aircraft, the Avenger, which uh, has a, a full fuselage, full cockpit around you, whereas the 303, it's more your... your uh, sitting from your waist up in, in the air. Uh, and then you can just graduate on into either our biplanes or our two-seat aircraft, which are using the exact same construction, but just require more time to put together. Now the little FP-404, can it be built as an old No, it cannot. In, in the U.S., there's no way to build the uh, 404 under the 254-pound uh, weight requirement. Uh, so it's going to be a, a registered aircraft. And in the experimental or amateur built category, both in Canada and the United States, all of your airplane, if somebody wanted to go with a little more power, a little more strength, they can do that. Absolutely, yeah. They, uh, they fit, you know, the, the rules are a little bit different between Canada and the U.S., depending, like in Canada, the, a lot of our aircrafts fit as basic ultralights, but in the U.S., we have the, the range of the five that are, are ultralight legal. 
Now we've talked about ultra aircraft, but I would imagine that probably a lot of your business is in the experimental amateur build. That's correct. We uh, offer a range of, uh, of two-place aircraft. And the way they really started was actually the first two-place aircraft we had was the Super Koala, which is a two-place version of our single-seat 202 Koala. And basically it was designed side-by-side -side seating with a two-stroke engine in it. Uh, and the Classic was also a derivative of the FP404 developed into a two seat. So we had those two come together and then customers started asking us can you produce some aircraft that used more of a traditional four stroke aircraft engine rather than the, uh, the two stroke engines. So from that we had the development of the Dakota Hawk uh, which was developed around the four stroke engines versus the two stroke of the uh, Super Koala. The Celebrity biplane is a four stroke version of the classic and then you have the, uh, the Horizon 1, Horizon 2 which have always been based around four stroke and their tandem seat aircraft rather than side by side. And then to cap it all off, probably one of our most nostalgic and popular aircraft is the R80 Tiger Moth, which is designed around four-stroke engine, uh, but is just a, a beautiful aircraft to see fly and uh, really gets a lot of attention. Now, power plant-wise, I guess most of your smaller ultralights then are flying on two-stroke engines? That's correct. Uh, either the uh, Hearth or the Rotax engines are basically the way that we're going. If you're going to stay part 103 legal, you're pretty much restricted to either the uh, Hearth F33 engine or finding an older Rotax 277 if you can find them. They're, they're not in production anymore. But from that, uh, if you're going to fly in the experimental category, you can go either to uh, a larger two-stroke, uh, you know, the, the 503 or the equivalent, uh, or you can actually step up into some four-stroke engines. In the ultralight category? Not in the ultralight oh, category, okay. if you're registering them. Okay. Uh, the, uh, when they step up, for example, say I had a um, uh, Fisher Koala, and it was a little heavy, and I was going to, say, run a 503 Rotex engine on it. What kind of, is there any difference in the airplane from the ultralight to the 503? Do you change anything strength-wise? The actual, the actual airframe is exactly the same. One of the things we do is we uh, have, have uh, tested all of our aircraft out to uh, plus six, minus four G. Uh, so they're very strong aircraft. Basically all that's going to happen if you're putting a larger engine is you're going to get faster takeoff performance and you're going to have a faster climb rate. But the uh, flight characteristics are going to stay exactly the same. Okay. And so we move up then from the single place aircraft uh, and we go into the uh, two place. I guess you're running the 503 and the 582 in uh, the uh, Super Koala and in the uh, Classic? Yep. And that's actually one of the beauty of our, of our aircraft is there's a huge flexibility in the different uh, power plants that you can put in. So you can put the, the 503 or 582 into some of the smaller two-place aircraft, but you can also put an HKS uh, 700 four-stroke in it if you prefer four-stroke to uh, two-stroke. And then as you go up into our different aircraft, you can uh, use a, a variety of, air, of engines from small Continental engines to, uh, you can put VW engines in them. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Tiger Moth flies very well with the Suzuki Geo uh, uh, conversion in it as well. So you've got like a wide range of engine selections. And also, I guess, price-wise. I mean, if you were to, for example, put a Rotax engine, it's $20,000, whereas you could probably go a third or uh, less in some cases with some of the others. And that's absolutely correct. Again, it's flexibility. Uh, you know, some people insist on having a brand new engine and uh, uh, paying that $20,000 for the new engine, but others are trying to fly more economically, which is really what we based our whole company around is it, it, affordable flying. So putting in either a, a VW conversion or a, a rebuilt Continental really lowers the price down on what your total airframe cost is going to be. Now, again, we haven't talked about price. If we were looking at ultralight, what kind of range are we looking at price-wise for an ultralight? Well, from the, the kit standpoint, the, our least expensive is the FP303, and that's a $5,800 uh, kit for the full airframe kit. And that includes everything from the fuel tanks to the wheels, covering material. Basically, all you need to provide is your engine, your engine mount, your paint, and your upholstery. Uh, and, uh, you know, finished aircraft uh, in our ultralights, you're looking in and around probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars depending on on the engine and, and the airframe that you're putting in and then stepping up into the bigger aircraft you, you can have a Dakota Hawk uh, up and flying fully equipped with a, a, a less expensive engine in it for under twenty six thousand dollars so you've got a lot of price range there for budget wise sure you can go from from uh, you know 
the price of a used car, uh, you can be flying, no problem. Okay, so you've got a customer, he walks in your door, he sees your facilities, and he says, hey, let's build me a Dakota Hawk, or give me a Dakota Hawk kit ready. How long are you going to be before you can actually get that kit to the gentleman? Well, it, uh, we build everything to order, so uh, we don't stock anything. So if they order just plans, they ship the next day. We produce our, the plans here ourselves. Uh, if you're ordering a partial kit, it ships in three weeks. A full airframe kit will ship in six weeks. And then a quick build kit, because there's assembly time required, is between eight and ten weeks, depending on what the uh, what order is. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, get a little bit more information, what's the easiest way to do that? Uh, they can call us at 905-838-1050 or go to our website at fisherfly.com. Com. And where are you physically located? We're at the Brampton Airport in Caledon, Ontario, Canada. And so that's just like, what, three hours north of Buffalo? That's correct. Yeah, it's, it's not a, a far drive from the border in the U.S. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.